Upon entering the galleries, we are confronted by your largest architectural model to date, the Google Charleston East headquarters, which has been commissioned by ICON. Why is this model so large? And why have you chosen to represent the interior walls rather than the futuristic exterior? Uh, we, we made the model of um, Google Charleston East large because we wanted it to be immersive for the visitor. As soon as they arrive in the gallery, we wanted them to feel the extent of, the, of these new networks and structures. And the, the reason why we decided to represent the interior was because in some ways we see the plan of the building as a kind of algorithm that determines the behaviour of, of the occupants. Also the plan is very immersive and as a physical person entering the space we want to be connected um, as a person to it physically. And for it to feel like um, an archaeological excavation. So we're in a sense looking at the building, um, we're looking at the future as though it was the past perhaps. Yes, it's an excavation and we're stripping off the roof and almost revealing the innards, so to speak. This gallery takes its name from the Greek Orthodox religious icons, which similarly influence your icon series. Portraits of the internet entrepreneurs, the masters of the universe. What is intended with this series? Uh, one of the, there are lots of reasons for making this reference, but um, one of the reasons is because these individuals have become so powerful. Uh, these companies have become so large and so wealthy. And, you know, 20 years ago, many of them didn't exist. 40 years ago, none of them existed. And um, they've risen from being tiny startups in spare rooms and garages uh, to become the largest companies on the planet. And um, so that's one reason. Another reason is that these people often present themselves a bit like religious icons, in a, albeit in a kind of modern way. So they regularly have conferences and sort of events where they have very large audiences of uh, either employees or people interested in the technological developments that they're making. And it's a bit like, you know, a cult. And these individuals often they often dress down in you know, trainers and jeans, t-shirts, even though they're billionaires. And in a way, they're kind of saying, you know, A, we're just like you, we're casual, we're informal. They're also, in a sense, perhaps deflecting attention away from their wealth and their power. And um, um, so, in a way, they're a bit like kind of leaders of a cult or something like that. And the more enthusiastic the audiences become, in a way, the more initiated they are into the doctrine of the cult or into the philosophy or into the latest tech developments and innovations. Also, their poses are almost like sort of Byzantine saints. And so they have a sort of religious overtone or undertone to the way they represent themselves, their hand gestures, um, the way they, they, they appear is yeah, the very lighting. important. The lighting, the <clears throat> backlighting, they almost glow like saints or icons. So we were very struck by this, having visited many cathedrals ourselves and looked at religious Byzantine paintings, how similarly they use this almost theatrical device. The architecture displayed here new structures created by giant technology companies is both pervasive and monumental. What does this reveal about the likes of Facebook, Google and Apple? Well, <clears throat> it reveals something very enduring in um, human societies that, you know, you know, like all powerful entities of the past, whether they be monarchs or popes or companies, uh, states, um, city states, high priests. They've all commissioned vast uh, architectural structures um, to demonstrate um, their power and wealth, but also to impress, um, impress their followers and to impress the competition. 
And uh, so in a sense, we're, we were very interested by this fact that it's again reoccurred. These companies are most of the time dealing in assets which are very intangible to most of us. And so this is the first time that, um, in a way, we're able to get a handle on how they see themselves and what their ambitions are and what their intentions are. Which is also why we are very interested in what they actually say because in verbatim they are um, revealing quite a lot. For instance, Steve Jobs saying, I want to put a ding in the universe. What he wants to do is to be remembered when he dies. You know, he wants to reverberate um, beyond his own life and into the next. Will this architecture be era-defining, like the factories of the Industrial Age or the Baroque palaces of the Enlightenment? Well, it's sort of too soon to say However, um, I think they are trying to put into place um, an architecture that um, is symbolic and is making a mark on the world. I mean, they're, they're using, although the buildings are often very modern, a lot of the time they're using typologies and forms which are very ancient. And um, so in a sense, we can ask whether the new Apple HQ, uh, although they call it a campus, um, that's been designed for Apple by Norman Foster, you know, will this building endure and, and will it one day, you know, will it rival the Colosseum or the Pantheon or Stonehenge as an architectural structure? It's quite a historic form. It's not something which has been entirely, you know, a new, a, a new gesture for, for now. It's, it's, it's based in history. Is this exhibition critical of the information uh, internet age? Does it celebrate it? Or is there something more insidious? I think well, it's a combination it, it, of both. You know. Yeah, in a way, it does. It does both, and it does neither. You know, it's. Um, I think we're, we're more interested in um, questioning, re revealing the structures, and looking at um, at the forms. And um, you know, there we're very interested in how it appears, and it's an intuitive process for us of examining. Uh, the evidence of what's going on. It's both enabling and disabling. Your work more generally explores social and cultural interactions. How do you see audiences engaging with this exhibition? We hope on many levels. Um, it's not just one way of working because we tend to work in lots of different ways in lots mm. of different mediums. I mean, I think to begin with, you know, um, we hope audiences can engage with it aesthetically and, and find that as a way into it. Uh, and then, you know, that's certainly how we became involved in the subject. You know, we, we came across these extraordinary buildings and uh, we noticed these other um, symbolic tropes and uh, visual uh, devices. And we just started to compare them and explore them and, and as a way of finding out, you know, what, what was meant by them. We were also downloading them from our computers as the buildings themselves were being built. So that for us was a, an interesting way to proceed. Um, in the past, we had to go to you know, architectural libraries to find the plans of the buildings and line up at photocopies, copiers to you know, copy the plans. But now we can download them ourselves and we can look at them online. And um, so that's a very interesting development. Could you tell us about meeting at art school? Did Alexandra Palace inform your interest in architecture? It certainly did, because it was a totally unstructured course, which meant we could move from sculpture to painting. Some people just made music, some people wrote. We moved from 2D to 3D, and we ended up collaborating. We collaborated together to make our first work together, which was called The Kitchen which was two kitchens divided by a membrane wall, and you entered the old kitchen looking through a window into a new one that was unobtainable, so you were forced to stand in the old one and look at the future through the membrane of the window. Mm. Yeah, initially when we started working together, we, we thought that each of us would just make one half of the kitchen, and the plan was that Nicky would make the old kitchen and I would make the new kitchen. Um, but as soon as we started actually working on the uh, installation, uh, 
we realized it was just easier and more interesting to help each other make the whole thing. So we just carried on working together. And I think um, since that time, I think more and more people have felt um, that collaborating is possible. And for us, it felt right. And after 40 years, we're still excited by collaborating.